there's probably nothing else as important. Like we think things are important, like money, passions, activities, family. But if you're not living you, then what are we doing in this life? There's a capitalist illusion that money equals happiness. In other words, money equals sovereignty. But we've all seen that that's absolutely not true. <laughs> sovereignty and happiness i don't know if those are necessarily aligned someone may be happy being someone else's slave you know as long as they've got a comfortable bed to sleep in and some food to eat you know but we know now that there's a higher level of health and happiness and it's involved in sovereignty and sovereignty as a philosophical concept and then as a practical application in your life perhaps in your career in your relationships but furthermore into the very food that you eat the house that you live in the community you exist in, you know, being able to, uh, to do it yourself fully, literally. Hi, and welcome to the Sovereign States of Mind podcast, where we explore personal sovereignty and what it means to reclaim authority over our own lives. This comes in many different shapes and forms, including homesteading, off-grid living, Bitcoin, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, parenting, health, gratitude and mindfulness, and much more. My name is Jordan Herbs, and I'm excited to have you along for the ride as I talk to different people about how we can gain more independence from these state and corporate entities. If you're interested in learning more about me and my life and how my family is becoming more autonomous and sovereign, you can find our YouTube channel. It's called A Family in Paradise, and we document our off-grid living in Hawaii. There are no sponsors for this show, so if you find value in anything here, your tips and donations are appreciated. There are links in the episode notes. You can also stream this episode on the Fountain podcasting app, and that will also help bring exposure to the show as well as send me some Satoshis. Another great way to support the show is to head over to www.sovereignstatesofmind.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You have the option to join a premium subscription. You can support the show as well as gain access to a new Telegram group I am starting so we can bring the discussion to the community and really try to tackle the topics that you, the audience, want to hear. For extra premium subscriptions and content creators, there will also be a subscription option to get access to the two or three highlight clips I make every week of every episode, and you will have the full rights to use those clips as long as you link back to the podcast. They are great for montages, inspirational quotes, and general social content. So if you like what we're working on, I really invite you to check out SovereignStatesOfMind.com and join the community in some way, shape, or form. Without further ado, let's get started. Sovereign States of Mind. What is sovereignty? You know, it's funny because you mentioned that word before when you were introducing the concept of your channel to me and i thought about it a little bit i, I was wondering what it meant to you because <laughs> when people everybody's understanding of words is you know could be described slightly differently especially by that individual so i you know it's, what does it mean to you what does it mean to me i don't know what does it mean to me i think it means independence freedom uh and I believe that that's the feeling that every human and animal uh, feels they're entitled to uh, you know, in, in life. So if one can achieve that in a practical way in these times we're living in, that's tremendous because obviously most of us were not born into a sovereign state. Maybe we were all born free, but the, the society that we are existing in mostly wouldn't be one in which the individual could be called sovereign that's what they're selling you in america but that's definitely not what's really <laughs> happening right yeah for me that was never a word on my radar until very recently when i realized it kind of summed up a lot of the values that were important to me for a long time and things that were developing inside me, whether it was relationships or my relationship to the government mm. or whatever it might be. And it's interesting because when you Google it, which I have been doing quite a bit, trying to build a brand with the word, there is not really a concise uh, agreement, a consensus on what it means. Uh, for some people, it's a political term, like a sovereign state, you know, that says I'm we're independent of of this other country. 
uh, in the new age sphere, like personal, well, not even new agey, but personal sovereignty is definitely a topic in the self improvement realm. You know, how do you reclaim sovereignty over who you are? Sexual sovereignty. There's definitely many places where the, the word is used, but yeah. So for me, it's all important. And that's why I wanted to start making content about it because there's probably nothing else as important. Like we think things are important, like money or, or whatever, uh, passions, activities, family. But if you're not living you, then what are we doing in this life? Right. There's a capitalist illusion that money equals happiness. In other words, money equals sovereignty. But we've all seen that that's absolutely not true. <laughs> and uh, sovereignty and happiness, I don't know if those are necessarily aligned. Someone may be happy being someone else's slave, you know, but uh, as long as they've got a comfortable bed to sleep in and some food to eat, you know, but we know now that there's a higher level of health and happiness and it's involved in sovereignty and the sovereignty as a philosophical concept. And then as a practical application in your life, you know, perhaps in your career, in your relationships, but furthermore into the very food that you eat, the house that you live in, the community you exist in, you know, being able to, uh, to do it yourself fully, literally, beyond just a little weekend project you know the whole package the ultimate diy <laughs> sustainable living quote unquote to use another hot phrase you know and that was <laughs> that was a philosophy a, a word that we followed and then we had to challenge ourselves and and redefine what that meant because there's also a lot of things as a modern human on this earth that we use every day that are impossible to sustain personally 100% uh, you're not going to be able to like pump gasoline <laughs> or create mass produce specific little plastic metal parts mm -hmm. for your gadgets and doodads, you know, just to name a few things. You're, you're not going to be able to have your own satellite, cell phone service, fiber optic cable network, you know, so certain things you propane. are propane, propane, <laughs> exactly. Another thing that you, you know, that, that gives you a certain independence from the grid, but you're still connected to this industry. Right. So that was a, a truth that we had to realize, you know, that we don't want to accept sometimes like, no, I'm going to be fully resistant to the system. Or it's even just ridiculous. My neighbors were under the guys. I don't know if they still are that they were not going to support the propane system because that was still the oil and gas companies and they were polluting earth, da, da, da. So they're, they were cooking everything with a special camping oven that used mirrors to reflect sunlight into this chamber to heat up their food and their coffee. Oh, boy. But it meant that they never really could cook things in the way that most people think. And they also never had like a fire. So, I mean, in that way, they were just kind of working against themselves because they weren't really healthy <laughs> living that way, especially with a small child, you know. How long did they last doing that? Well, the, the father has already left. No. He already stepped out, probably because he was bearing the brunt of the physical hardship. And uh, yeah, he couldn't hang. And that's another reality that isn't often talked about online and so forth is the ones that didn't make it. Because there's a lot who come and try anywhere. And one thing leads to another. Their relationship fizzles or they just... the, the straw breaks and the camel's back breaks them and they decide that it's not for them and they can't continue and they've got to go back from whence they came or try this game somewhere else in a climate that's quote unquote less forgiving so yeah there is a fair bit of that you know that's a struggle Lau and i discuss i mean monthly i mean when we first got back a few months ago i think you and i were talking we we're like i'm not sure we can handle this and in another piece of content we're creating soon, one of the big things like we've learned here is choose your battles. You know, are we going to create our oven from mirrors or are we just going to, you know, use propane? <laughs> like there's plenty of things, you know, the cloth diapers, you know, we use cloth diapers and we wash them and it's a lot of work. Well, I commend you on that because that was one thing that we just quickly gave up on 
that amount of it work. took us two years to realize we don't want to do this anymore and now she's almost done with diapers so it's like okay <laughs> right there's <laughs> pick your battles there are things you'll be able to do comfortably and easily that can make an impact in your life and and in in the great the grander sphere of the world but there's also certain things that are uh that could be very difficult and just out of reach or out of your realm so yeah the, the proper expectation you know but that's the, a lot of what homesteading is about is adjusting one's expectation from this postmodern 21st century cybernetic being back to a natural creature from the earth who's more in touch with the energies of the the living world around them and less so with the the screens and the radar and the plastic and the yeah. signals and the phones and the credit cards and the whatever's in a way it's reclaiming the sovereignty over your physicality which is essentially it's a physical world we live in baby so we've forgotten yeah <laughs> you know you have to set the mind free first but once the mind becomes free if it realizes that it's emancipated in this modern day slavery so as has is said then you've got to break free and that brings it all around to the very first point in homesteading which is making a commitment in one's own mind a resolve in their self that the modern life they're living is unfulfilling and it never will be and that there has to be a better way and the way is to look down to the earth and back to the forefathers and the grandparents and the elders and and those who live in a more simple fashion elsewhere in the world concurrently in the third world nations the people who grew up in a simpler way due to their you know lack of finances as the west may view their certain situation but perhaps those people are contented as in the individuals we we don't know we can try and see if we go travel to some of those places uh but uh i guess that's what i was talking about readjusting our first world expectations to a more realistic mm -hmm. natural understanding of how life really does work and like you said earlier just to stop stressing because it can't be a, a vision of perfection and it won't be what you read in the book and no one has blazed the path that that you will in your specific situation so yeah th there's not a book on this uh, it's important <laughs> that we talk story and share what if you would you be interested in sharing a little bit about what brought you to making that commitment because if i know if i i know very little of your lives before coming here but I think you were pretty successful, no? Yes, and that <laughs> is a typical story that you that I've heard and I feel it's like an allegory in the modern world is that I specifically we moved here to the Big Island of Hawaii from New York City. <laughs> we being my wife, my partner Marie and I uh and we lived there together for about 10 years and we hacked it and paid our dues and did all the nitty gritty stuff uh, that and worked very, very hard in our own sovereign way there in a different respect, building these art careers for ourselves. So from a youth, I understood through certain musical movements and counterculture mm -hmm. facets in, that came before us and so forth. This is before the internet was such a big deal and, and nobody had cell phones, we already were hip to the fact that Babylon's going to fall and you got to step out. See, every generation in every civilization comes to this realization after a certain point and, 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 and different generations come to it in different ways. There's like waves of this. So I'm coming from this certain place and we were counterculture people that wanted to be artists. I was doing tattoos. She was doing this textile embroidery. And, and even as self-starters, working for ourselves, using social media to promote our craft, paying our own taxes, paying our own bills, doing our own scheduling, doing all that stuff. We did everything. And getting to a point where we're only working three, four days a week. We have our own studios. Everything's paid. But still looking at the numbers and saying, God, we're having to pay this much money a month just to maintain this lifestyle 
And, and, and what really pushed us was the place that we lived in, which was a brownstone in Bedford Stuyvesant. Uh, we had got it a great deal. Well, that was one of the neighborhoods that became gentrified and popular. So the great deal that we had five years later was super below market value. And when the building changed owners, uh, they kept upping the rent every year. And we understood that that situation by its definition wasn't very sustainable. Also because we were working in the realm of fashion and art and we already knew that most people, people have like their 15 minutes of fame and then, and then, and then you're washed up, you're nothing. You got a one way ticket to Palookaville, you know? So <laughs> what do we do? We took the natural resource of that city of most cities, which is money, right? Art, <coughs> culture. And we left all of our material things. And we decided a few years before we actually made the physical move that we had to get out of there and that we wanted to take our time, money and energies and invest them in, to something that we could call our own, a house. We weren't sure whether or not we wanted to do a homestead off grid, back to the land thing, but we definitely wanted to grow plants and have our own home. And so after traveling to different places with our work as artists and, and kind of scoping the local scene, weighing things back and forth, Hawaii was the long shot. Hawaii became the destination. We gave and sold all of our stuff away. We packed everything we had into boxes and bags and jumped on the plane. We rented a place for a few months and decided that we better go ahead and put some money down and buy something so that once again, money wasn't floating out and energy and time was being maintained. And we're glad that we did it when we did because property values have more than doubled in the last five years. So, right. so that leads us to number two, uh, finding the right land. How did you find it? Well, we already knew the general area. The state was Hawaii. The island was the big island. Why? The land was affordable. And I think for a lot of people who would be listening to this, uh, that is a big factor. Most people in the world don't have the means to get the million dollar property. Um, most of the people that would be successful in this lifestyle are people that work hard, but those people are going to also need to be smart in their decision making. So rather than looking at how large the property is, how much money it does or doesn't cost, I would urge that person to, to research like uh, the weather patterns, the annual rainfall, how much hours of sunlight does it get? What's the soil like? What's the soil? Does it have soil or is it rock? Or sand or <laughs> coral? Is it, what are the sort of natural disasters your area is prone to? What about the pests, the disease, the bugs, the, the animals? What plants could you grow there or not grow there? Were do these you, all things you considered? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to have a winter or not? So we looked at places like New Mexico, upstate New York, Austin, Texas, mm. Hill Country area. Uh, Hawaii is a tropical area. You know, France, the countryside of Did France. Did you look into France? I was going to. Sure, because my yeah. wife is French. Right. She holds her a passport there. You know, we could have played the same game there. I speak French, so it wouldn't have been too much of a culture shock. We've been married a long time, but there you have a lot of taxes still you have to pay. Um, you have a winter, of course. Um, and the great thing about Hawaii for me is one of the factors that helped us make the decision is you have the year round growing season. So it's, there's enough water, yeah. heat, sunlight to grow plants, which equals food. Uh, year round. And that was a simple. I think there's something to say as well uh, for anyone that might be in a similar boat as having another country to move to. I've spent months in the French countryside and culturally speaking, it might not be for everyone in the same vein as moving to West Virginia from New York city might not be for everyone. Uh, and some people are just have different cultures. That's an excellent <laughs> point you bring up because we talked about all the scientific information on the, the, the climate, but we didn't talk about the, the human culture of the region that you might be moving to. Is it one that you'll get along with or not? Is that could be a great factor. We are humans. 
And even if you're living off grid, you're going to be part of a community of other people in that area. That's just a natural thing. We need other people. We like that camaraderie, someone to share ideas with, problems, solutions, uh, go have dinner with, etc. The community and culture here in this specific spot, the specific little corner of Hawaii is probably the number one reason we chose here beyond anything else i mean i always loved that you could grow things year round and things will just grow there's just so much life here whether you like it or not and that life kind of transcends from from the earth and into just the way we live and i wanted to raise my kids in that so i knew for a long time this is where i wanted to be because of the community well, I, can I, just, I, I heard everyone's it. feeling that same call i i believe that this isn't your first tour in other words, that you've been here in this district before in years past. As a bachelor, traveling, yeah, doing, doing so the broke. You, you yeah. saw it <laughs> and you you noted it and said, this is maybe a cool place. And I've seen a lot of the world. I've and, traveled and then, and then you lot. and did that. And then, this, and then met that somebody and said, okay, yep. I think I know that little turtle beach where we can go lay some eggs. I think I know paradise. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the that, fact that it's affordable and the fact that the people here are, I don't want to say everyone's incredible, but everyone is unique and individual and accepts you for being you. Well, and that's your perspective being the individual that you are. I just want to <laughs> underline that I agree, but you and I are certain, a certain type of person. Other types don't jive as well. Perhaps, which but. is true, because I don't want people to think, oh, this is truly a paradise. There's a lot that comes with it. And there are other types around here too, tweaker types. That's true. Trump types. Well, and hearkening bro back, types, hearkening back to earlier in our conversation too. Like sometimes we wonder, is this really for us? Just because of the amount of work it takes to to be here. <laughs> But that, 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 that could also be just insecurities and th processes that happen, just part of the uh, part of the journey. Yeah, I mean, well, specific to this place, I mean, I'm sure every place has this an energy that's there before any humans came. And some say that the energy here will, yeah, can like welcome you in a loving embrace or kind of spit you out Shake and throw you, you on the rocks, you know. Maybe if you get back up and it'll come give you a hug, but... Well, my first maybe it'll kick times, you back down again. This is, you know, I the first I came here what four to at least four different times before finally moving here. Each time, I got my ass kicked. Well, spiritually I, speaking, yes, I had been here before as well. About I first came to this island as a University of Hawaii student from Houston, Texas, is where I was born and raised as like a twenty year old kid, and I lived in Hilo right up the coast but uh -huh. still on the east side so as a young kid that was living in the first place that he lived in leaving home not having any kind of car at that time or 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 you know smartphones or anything we were you know limited but i saw with that young mind and the eyes and the heart and i stayed for a few years and got a local girlfriend and dropped out of school and got <laughs> learned some psychic lessons actually learned some really i mean this this place yeah really opened me up to some of that i those that sort of thinking so you'd know about it yeah well. i knew about it i knew about okay. it and then that's why recently it was the long shot decision because there was a strong note in my mind about this place even though it had been 15 years since i stepped foot here that that place was very special and that you got, it's at least worth checking out one more time, you know? So when we did, it was right after the 2018 eruption or actually the eruption was going on. We were looking at these other places, then the eruption stopped. And I said, babe, I think this might be a nice time to go and maybe get a deal on some land. Right. Yeah. Which is kind of what happened. Uh, like I said, now the, the same lots that we bought for half the price are valued at, at twice as much as they were worth then. So. And so that kind of taps in well, everything we just kind of covered is our number three on the list, which is do you do your research? Uh, and that might include going there and definitely, you know, with your family or your partner and see if you jive, because even if it's paradise, you might not jive and stay for longer than a week, stay for a month, rent a place, stay for a mm -hmm. summer, stay for a season, work on somebody else's farm, stay mm -hmm. in somebody else's house, do a house swap, visit a friend, 
Get out into the community, go to the local farmer's markets, go on the nature hike. Don't be a tourist, basically. Try to get into it, see what they're doing, what they're growing, look around. Having, you know, already watched some videos and read some stuff on your own. So you're, you're kind of, you know, trying to be tuned in to what's, what's happening there. Yeah. And because any, you know, someone's paradise can be anywhere. It's the paradise is a vision in your own head. Exactly. And if you want to grow bananas and coconuts and pineapples, come on down. But if you're more into the peaches, plums, Apples. nectarine, cherries, then you, it's not going to happen here because we can't. We can't physically grow those crops. So if you want the, the pure white driven snow on in the winter morning and the maple syrup, that's not here. Right. If you want, you know, the misty morning rain. And, you know, a lot of the homesteading YouTube channels I find are all people in the forest that definitely gets snow. They probably have maple syrup nearby and they're just kind of in the middle of the woods. Right. And that's a vision of that we didn't actually achieve in our dream home homestead situation is we, we, we initially desired a more rural location where our nearest neighbor would be far out of sight and mm. far out of earshot. What we ended up with again, because of affordability and because of a compromise, there were other areas nearby with larger parcels that were too expensive for us to afford but what we knew about this corner of the island was we really liked the climate this particular amount of rainfall to sun ratio the temperature the proximity to the ocean that was important to us so we compromised by buying a smaller lot in a residential neighborhood now the residential neighborhood is halfway off grid and that there's no running water within the whole neighborhood and it's many many miles from the nearest store or town um but the lots are the size they might be in a, a neighborhood in a, right. in, a, in a regular city and and there's definitely that sort of vibe there and but like what, i saw a new house on the main street being built the house is as big as the lot right <laughs> literally <And that's> more, <laughs> we're going to see more of that as the people who desire to move there are not radical free thinkers scrapping together a jungle shed with whatever weed money they made <laughs> but retirees and professionals people who work remotely and people who have a higher budget to hire professionals to maximize the efficiency of you know structure on their lot the other thing about the neighborhood you chose were you aware that you were going to have children at the time that's a very good point because that, I think it's a gr you live on a great block for having kids. That's an excellent point that he brings up. <laughs> in your homestead situation, is it going to be you as an individual, you and some friends, you and a romantic partner? Are there going to be children involved? Do you already have children involved? The expectations need to be geared around the humans that will be living there. And so, yes, we did have an intention of starting a family that was part of the decision making process in leaving the city, which is not a family place at all. And now we have two young children. They were both born at the house that we built with our hands on the land that we cleared. Beautiful. And the, the vision is coming to reality. And now it's definitely rounded off and it's fuller. And I understand that it's the natural progression of this living organism to not only pass on the genetic information, but also be surrounded by beautiful children and family that help challenge you and remind you of yourself um, and your, your shortcomings and your strengths. And uh, it's, it's, it's the best thing you can grow. It's the best seed you can plant. You know, and it, it's going to take the most work and energy out of you, but it'd be the very, <laughs> the most rewarding. Right. So yes, we did have that intention. The first structure that we built was not large enough to house that entire situation. So we've added on to it recently. Um, yeah. And just the last note on that is we, we chose where we chose uh, be, instead of your neighborhood because I wanted a little more space. 
and I wanted to be close to your neighborhood for the kids. But in retrospect, some parts of me feel like maybe that was a, a little bit selfish, even though in the long run, it's probably a good idea. But just the fact that kid, when your kids can just walk out the door or the gate and like there's other kids playing, that's like incredible. There's That's nothing. It. How do you get that anywhere else? Anywhere in the world these days with as much yeah. fucked up shit that happens that I read about and stuff. But yeah, I do know other kids and families that live in the area, surrounding area in a more rural situation. And sometimes the kids do lose out a little bit on that because they don't have as many friends to play with or it's not as easy it's for them. It's accessible. To, to, exactly. Yeah. Literally, because they're so far away, they don't have a car. And they still get around and have fun, but that was a big bonus about this area. And not only for the young, uh, but also for the adults. I've gained so much by sharing knowledge and resources with the other people that live there, young and old. Whether it's a smile and a wave on a, on a, on a crummy day that helps cheer you up, or someone giving you some free plants to, to put yeah. in the ground to beautify your homestead or a b building advice or mechanic advice in the car, all that stuff. Community. Um, right. That's, yeah, that's a thing that we overlooked in, uh, in the original decision-making process mm. and probably a lot would because in a big city, the sense of community is not as strong as it, as it is in a smaller group of people the individual is played up in, in a, in a, in a city setting, but it takes a village and it takes a town and it takes a group of people to, to manage property and, 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 and land and, and family and yeah, right. mental health. So you've made the commitment You've found the right location, found the land, you've done your research. Next up, create a vision. Right. Now that kind of plays into the first question, which is who, who's going to be living there? Uh, how old? How young? Uh, what do they need? What do you want? Is it going to be a farm? Is it just going to be a house in the woods? Uh, are you going to have animals there? Uh, what are you hoping to accomplish? Do you want to, I mean, if we're talking about homesteading here, so hopefully you're looking to accomplish producing as much food as you can and being as self-reliant and self-sufficient as possible. So the vision should reflect that. And would, would, does the vision stage include starting to sketch it out or would that be in the next phase of creating a plan? I, I think that, the vision and the plan are connected, but they're also separate. The vision is kind of like your dream with whatever limited understanding one might have at the beginning of the journey. That stage. That's mm -hmm. an important note that obviously you won't know as much starting out as you will later after you've gathered information from local resources and experiential wisdom. But you still probably have some kind of vision or dream, even some way that you imagined living when you were young or that good memories you had of a farm where your family lived or a place you visited, mm. uh, an idea of how a building might look or how, where it might be situated. You know, so I think the creative vision, the inspiration, the dream needs to be imagined first and then the next step would be trying to create a practical plan right. and the steps on how we can become the biggest pineapple farm in the state <laughs> or the number one homestead. Fr fruit tree grafter, right? Or having our chickens, our bees, our rabbits, our and garden. Or yeah. So the vision is definitely a bit more ethereal. It's a bit more ephemeral. It's a, it's a, it's an abstract concept. And I think it should feel pretty magical. I think looking when I've created visions for projects or other things in my life, and that's like a very fun stage because there's no limits, right? Like what is the potential that you want to optimize for? And then when you go into the next step, step five, make a plan. That's when you, like you said, get more practical, get more pragmatic. What's realistic here? Uh, and then you have, 
maybe time frames. Like in, in this first six months, it's this. In the first mm. couple years, it's this. Mm. And then by the time the kids are grown up, it's this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And long term plans, short term goals. Some of that process would probably be doing some more research, you know, more specific to your vision in the area that you have decided to buy land in. And then, and then, but it's also just important to remember that. We got to remain flexible. We got to be open to to tacking, to pivoting at times because what we can afford in the beginning might not be the ultimate dream. We first wanted to live here to start a retreat center with yoga and health because so many people we'd always come across would be like, wow, I'd love to just spend a week with you guys uh, and learn to eat healthier and learn to do the right exercise activity in the morning and meditate, blah, blah, blah. And I always thought like, wow, what a great place to come heal. I'd love to invite people I meet here. That would be amazing. But that's more of a 10, 15 year plan as right. opposed to a right. you know, six month plan. This is the tough thing. And this is like part of the big lesson of homesteading is, you know, I think maybe some of our great grandparents could get up, chop wood, milk the cow, do the chores all before breakfast every day. But they were things they were really excited about would be like, going to watch a movie in town on every third Sunday or, you know, they, they, maybe they didn't have quite as big of imagination. They hadn't seen as much, but they, they had the practical doing figured out just out of necessity of how people lived in those days. So yeah, the world is smaller and life is simpler. It's easy for a lot of modern people to imagine a lot. It's a good point. But the hardest part about it is then actually, making all that happen and then like you're saying staying flexible and being patient um that's another tragedy of modern society is everybody wants things instantaneous they want everything they could imagine on sale at a great deal mailed right to their home two days later prime you know at a push of a button and real life doesn't really work that way and i think that's the enriching thing about homesteading gardening parenting watching life unfold watching things grow and learning about a better way to you know align oneself and 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 how to things that you're paying attention to and things that are important and and uh that that's kind of like yeah the magic of the process is that in the end you've created a homestead but you've also transformed yourself And you know that it couldn't have been possible without the inner transformation because you, you now as a sovereign individual are solely responsible. You're accepting quite a great deal more responsibility as, as a quote unquote homesteader than quite a bit, a civilian in, in, in a city situation where you're having all these other professionals perform these services for you uh, as an exchange of, of money, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so you're now your own plumber, your own electrician, your own carpenter, gardener, you know, mechanic, your uh, own uh, farmer. Cook, like, farm, yeah. <laughs> Not even. Oh, and the funny thing about that part of it, which I think is important for a lot of us wanting to homestead, or at least it was for us is like, you know, how much food do you really trust at the store anymore? Also, well, you know, like at a certain slim to none. Yeah. I mean, the amount of stuff that goes into mass producing fruits and vegetables is crazy. And as much of that as we can just like do on our own in a more healthy, loving uh, environment, I feel like that's how I want my kids to, to grow up. Well, it's, it's kind of like the old anecdote of thinking globally and acting locally and what's more local mm. than your own self and your own family, your, your nuclear family, the people directly around you, you're related to bonded to legally by blood, uh, by love. Um, and yeah, the food that you eat, you got to eat food to survive. You got to live someplace. If you're not buying that food at the store, if you're not renting that place or buying something that's already been created for a lot of money at an incredible interest rate and an insanely inflated (laughs) price. I was just reading this morning how the same house that a a 22 year old 
would buy now uh, in Hawaii uh, is 4.5 times the price that it would have been when their parents would have bought it when they were 22. So a 22 year old would not be buying a house right. in so Hawaii. So $250,000 house is now one point such and such million dollars, right? I just saw a meme of like the, the Simpsons house and how the, in 1989 it was normal for a family of five uh, with one person working a full-time job could afford a house that size. But this is where it turns into is that we have to adjust our expectations. 1999 expectation is based on certain geopolitical situation where America is standing on top. <laughs> this is the country we're living in. This is the language we're speaking. This is the podcast we're being broadcast from the 50th state, Hawaii, which is still under the jurisdiction of the United States of America, even though a lot of people so here they say. could argue against that. Well, I like the argument of like the lava is new land. So whose land is that? Well, the end of the day, this is a truth in a lot of homesteading. The natural world is there is a natural law and that law says you and what army, which means if we claim this and use it, who's going to tell me I don't have the right to? And with what physical force are they going to step in and prevent me from doing that? How often? So what am I really, truly free to do or, or not? You mm -hmm. know, so that's. A lot of governments challenge them each other on those notes, large ones, Russia, China, United States, smaller yeah. ones. And uh, people here, squatters and so forth, people who don't have any legal, their car is totally illegal, but they drive around for five years. So who's without fooling? a single problem. Well, that's also why we love it here. Right. Right. Well, that's it's very permissionless in a lot of ways. Because who is going to come and say that you can't do that where is the funding where are the police where they're not here and that's exactly why we do like it here but that's <laughs> the truth of living out in the woods is that oftentimes might versus right and the philosophy that you carried with you from your urbane setting which is very hip and free might not actually resonate 100% with the true laws of nature and you may have to adjust your expectations. What is anybody entitled to a home? Fuck no, you're not entitled to a goddamn thing. You're lucky and blessed that you wake up every morning alive and healthy and it's your responsibility to do your damnedest every day to take care of yourself, to work, your family, to right, do it and make it happen. Whether that's working some crazy high paced job career in a big city and doing it that way, or waking up here in the country and saying, okay, I'm a self-starter. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I have to be an individual. This is my, my own business. I have to work. I am my own worker, my own boss, and I can't be lazy and I have to have some plans and I have to be smart about it and consider that your time was worth money that you used to make and make it worth that much fucking money, you know, make the house that you built in a year be one that's hundreds of thousands of dollars because the time you put it was, was was focused or whatever, you know? And, right, um, right. Okay, so we got the land, we got the vision, we got the plan. We're a little more settled into why we're here. Shaping the terrain. Now this is okay. starting to get physical. This we're, is this <laughs> is transcending. We're starting to 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 put hands into the to the earth here. That's it. The uh so, who, Huli Lima or something turn the hands like it's a yeah, we gotta get in the hands in the dirt, getting dirty, getting out of the nitty gritty. You've thought, you've read, you've bought, you took a ticket, you jumped on a plane, into a fucking Uber, unpacked your bags, now you're here. <laughs> what do you do? You get to your land, you've got odds are the land is raw. The land maybe has an old structure on it. You this is part of making the plan too, is trying to map that out literally on paper, maybe you've got a drone, you can take some footage from up above, get a bird's eye view, figure out obviously where the boundaries are. You may have to call somebody there who uh, does surveying to find your pins and make a clear line of where the boundaries are. That's super important uh, when you're making your plan uh, now and later generationally, you don't wanna abuse those, those ley lines and get liens and fucked up situations where it might make it difficult to sell or exchange land um, later, even if that isn't your intention now. So follow those guidelines. Yeah, and then looking at the, the trees and plants that are there, how is it elevated? Is it hilly? Is there a low-lying area? 
where does the sun come from in the morning? Where is the east west orientation? Where is the southerly orientation? Is there mm. is there a wind block naturally near you with forests? Is it open? Is there a field? Is there a mountain cliff side? Uh, paying attention to the natural features of the area if you can and even stay on the land in a raw way i mean you'll be there working so if you're paying attention you'll be just kind of noticing things um and 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 then starting to shape the terrain literally okay we need to cut down these trees weed whack and clear and dig up this area so we can have a driveway a place where our vehicle can access deeper into the terrain and start to develop it by bringing materials building things bring, you know moving people uh moving stuff out you know here specifically yeah you would need to like clear out some plants maybe have a bulldozer by hand move some rubble and rocks bring in some truckloads of cinder and dirt to create a hard pack level where would you know you're oh i know so well i just want to say because you've seen my driveway you saw my driveway before and you've seen it now much uh, better now back to finding the right spot um remember that building on a hill is great but it will require a lot of energy and resources uh i mean it might not depending on certain things but uh you gotta you gotta make sure that you understand how not just your car will get into the terrain to get into the garage, but trucks that might need to deliver something, uh, a tractor, maybe. Right. Uh, there's there's a lot to consider. And so depending on, you know, where you think you'll build this and put this, if you have a vehicle that needs to get there and you're wanting to, you know, live on a hill, just keep that in mind. Or, or even if the property that you bought was multiple acres and you decided you wanted to punch in. Oh, at least halfway to build your house there so you're further removed from any neighbors then that is a big part as just creating a path a driveway to access that deeper area and and that's maybe the very first step of shaping the terrain but the shaping the terrain is broader in that now you've gotten your vehicle your driveway your access point and now you know maybe in your head you thought Oh, I'm going to chop everything down with a hatchet and I'll sharpen it every night by the firelight. And, and I'll mill the lumber. Right. And then a couple of weeks <laughs> later, you decide, you know, if we can just get this thing done, it'll be a miracle. And you've decided to go into your budget and hire the local excavator guy that for a fair price knows what they're doing and has done it a lot, a lot in the neighborhood and, and can advise <laughs> you on points that you may have not considered due to his experience. Yeah. Sometimes you'll find that that exchange is a fair one. And, um, it's, you know, whether or not you had a large machine at your disposal, we didn't in the beginning, we had just chain a small chainsaw, and like a yeah string trimmer a weed whacker that was gas powered pretty strong um our lot wasn't too hairy it was half overgrown field and the other half you know lightly forested and pretty flat right very flat yeah that's that's blessing. that was and that was part of choosing that lot you know mm -hmm. we we knew that it would be easy for us to go in there with the means that we had and develop it and that therein too you know the, whether there's a structure that exists there how flat is it how big is it how far is it from the main road how far is it from the main town how far is it from the neighbor uh those are all parts of that you know and then also uh, just this these are important points for finding the right land right how many acres do you think is reasonable let's just say one man whether you're alone or you're the father of a family what is like who do you think is the perfect lot size? I have my opinion, but I'd love to hear what you think. I'd say this in general, less than you think, <laughs> right? And so the, the, the point I'm making is that oftentimes people are looking at the numbers. This is 1.68 acres. This is three acres. This is 10 acres. This is 30 acres. Oh, great. Yeah. Even more cool. is better, right? More. more money, more problems, more acreage, more land, more to manage, especially in a tropical setting where then everything else that is not an intentional planting is could be potentially a vector for disease mm. uh wild hogs destroying stuff you know so 
how much that's where you break it down and said if i were utilizing the land that i did have efficiently and properly you know how much would you need to to support oneself one individual how much land would you need to have enough fruit trees and and vegetables and and chickens and stuff on that one area and still be able to maintain it right yeah. assuming you know you know i'd say i'd say someone. around an acre around an acre yeah i think yeah. and but you're pretty full time huh i'm Home definitely setting? full time i don't yeah. do Anything else that I do is less time than the homestead. And the homesteading now is just staying home instead. And it's kind of <laughs> what happened during the... So backtrack, we moved here, chose the land, started to build. Son was born. Boom, pandemic happens. Now, the next few years, we're locked down at the house with nowhere to go, nothing else to do, and no excuse not to. Great. <laughs> so that's what allowed us to focus and get a lot done so that's why i made the joke staying home instead what does homestead mean the lifestyle you're choosing is to be at your residence at your homestead right. more often than it's going to be out at the restaurant going to a museum taking a trip somewhere playing at the beach all day right. uh, and when you have kids this is something i'm learning from experience the hard way that affects the terrain you choose uh you know, it's hard for us to just go outside and play. Aggie will fall on the gravel and hurt her knee like yesterday. Uh, things are just hilly. They don't like walking up the driveway or something. Whatever it is, uh, it's not very easy for my children to just hang out outside while I pull the weeds or teach them to pull the weeds or whatever it is. And one day that will be different, not just because they'll get older, but because I'll finally get there and make everything more manageable. But really important to think about because... In general, we do have to go somewhere else uh, mm. to the water or something mm. when mommy needs her space and alone time. Like it's either that or we're on the lanai and everyone's home home uh, cabin fever. Right. Well, so that's part of too living in a rural situation or spending years and years and years away from a city or society is that after a while there is a desire to go connect more with the surrounding community or other friends that you've made, whether it's visiting their homesteads or going to a beautiful natural place outside, like the beaches mm -hmm. or parks that we're blessed with here in Hawaii and other places. Um, but then there's, you know, a balance of, of work and play as there always is. And I kind of just, we make a little rules like, okay, let's do our chores today and make sure we've got our dinner figured out. And then we can, you know, by whatever, time we get that done and then we can go play the rest of the day or whatever and that these little games and little baby goals you set for yourself and the kids that just help keeping things moving because the lifestyle too can get monotonous and mundane as the years go by and you just seem like you're just kind of doing the same thing every day this relentless pattern of work when does it ever end you know but there are these little victories like you said you're getting some eggs from the chickens or moving into the new room you built on the house or yeah i have a very different day to day than you i'm not full time homesteading i'm like one day i'll be there right but i'm still i'm still here i am shooting a podcast i'm going to edit it and produce it later i'm sitting on the computer for a few hours every day and like i mentioned earlier I'll be fortunate if I find two hours during the week to go out and work on something on the lot because it's difficult for me to shift gears. Uh, if I'm being creative, I'm on the computer, I'm I'm creating content, whatever it is, like that's one frame of mind. But then going out into the into the world, going out onto the land, working on something, whether it's the chicken coop, planting the tree, or moving the areca palm that's going to be in the way of the, the mango tree you gave us one day soon. Uh, whatever it is, that just takes this completely different part of my brain that is intimidating to shift over, which is why I notice uh, there'll be a few days before, during and after when the free mulch day is, then I'm just hardcore outside all day working. And that's it for probably a month aside from some routine maintenance. I mean, um, I think uh, you were sharing some about yourself that's you have in common with a lot of people, including myself, which is it is difficult to shift gears f from these extreme activities that require totally different sides of the brain that we're all involved in. I also still uh, 
find time to create things in an artistic way. And that's, you know, but what you described in the most time and, and what I've done with my artistic output is you kind of schedule it and you figure out there's times when you do this and there's times when it makes sense to do that. And it's hard to just do this and then do that and all in one day. Uh, yeah. So same likewise around mulch day, I think you and a lot of people, <laughs> The county mulch around here gives uh, the county dump provides free mulch a, a couple of days a month. So what I like to do is anticipate that, clean up the garden, prepare some stuff, maybe some planting ideas, get the mulch, put it on what needs it, you know, and then a few days after. But w I've reached a place now with my building that I'm I'm stressed out less because I feel like I'm in a a high level of completion with my structure, my house that I've been building the last four years. And that's another shift from right. the garden to the house. Well, so <laughs> there's right. There's, there, there's, there's different facets of the homestead, right? There's, there's you, the individual, your own mental health and sanity. There's the family and, and the relationship and the other people that are living there with you. There's the physical structure building house that you're, living in and to what degree of comfortability or or finishedness it, it is in your mind and then there's the living environment around there the garden the trees the permaculture food forest that you're you've been working on perhaps a bunch of stuff from seed and that's that stuff that just takes many years of planting the initial plantings and observing that and seeing what works and deciding where a good spot or a better spot is for a different kind of plant that you learned about and how to plug in some ground cover and where the vines fit in and where does a chicken coop go and managing yeah then the animals making sure they're fed and they're not pest free and they're producing whatever the way that you wanted them to and do they have enough food and water have you eaten enough? Did you take your shower today? Did you clean your cut? Cause it's getting looking like staff, whatever. <laughs> and there's all these things you have to do all the time. So then it's breaking down basically to like, what's the most important thing that we have to do today. Mm -hmm. And that kind of breaks down in the whole process of establishing the homestead because, okay, we're kind of jumping into a couple of different things, but back to the list is, You've shaped the train, you've made the driveway, you're starting to dig holes, put some plants here, pile up some compost, this and that. Now a structure is needed to house or shelter the humans and their tools and materials. Um, and this can't be stressed enough, especially in a if you're in a place where it rains a lot. Any place. I was so stressed out about all my materials just laying out on the land because I didn't have anything before we started building this thing. I had them delivered here and they were just sitting out in the rain. Now, fortunately, the, for this, the steel panels, like that's not the worst thing in the world. It's not like leaving lumber out in the rain even if it's treated it's like so, so, it's like so imagine it's like this show like survivor or something like that that you land on a desert island in our case or or in out in nature somewhere by yourself you know what are the priorities <laughs> to establish you know, shelter food water right. right those are so then those are the most important things that you carry with you on your day-to-day -day priority list you know what like is the catchment tank full enough you know now that it hasn't been raining for so long right. or something like that uh are we getting bitten up by bugs and do i need to make sure there's a screen on this open window because my kids are have red marks all over their face mm -hmm. that is the priority not planting the mango right right i mean right. the fire ants are on the line so that's where you squeeze in the lot you're talking about you know the gardening and shifting gears what's the most important thing you touched on this too is the financial reality of supporting this sort of free lifestyle and as is your your female partner your wife the mother of your children is is heavily occupied with the two beautiful children that you have and maintaining the household heavily your responsibility and the role you're now having to assume in more of a traditional way that financial responsibility probably lays mostly on you. And that's another thing people have to realize that the roles of partnership, man, wife, husband, wife, father, son, daughter, mother, auntie, grandma, uncle, whatever, 
in the homestead context, you may evolve into a different version of that role that you have played in the existing relationship before. You may have to man up. You may have to woman down. You may have to uncle up. You may have to, you know, whatever. It the is things your kids huge. are doing and playing with are not going to be what you'd imagine. But just in the, you know, we, Lau and I come from entrepreneurial backgrounds. You know, when we met single, like that's what we did was we worked on our, on our projects and it, we we were stoked and now it's like this constant for years and i think now we're finally reaching an equilibrium of like hey yeah you have to woman down and it's like yeah i think and i have to man the fuck up i think that was an even bigger deal <laughs> both big and, deals and both equal because that's the thing is that one responsibility doesn't outweigh the other they're, they're equally important and the best way that they can be accomplished is by dividing and conquering and saying, well, who would be naturally more capable? Who excels at that? And, and in your particular relationship, that would be the dynamic. Exactly. We're not saying that, uh, we're saying oftentimes it is more traditional, not to say that you haven't seen the roles reverse. Of uh, course, it could be anything. Sure. It could uh, be anything. And it's just but, interesting. But in the sense of, in, in, in of getting things done of this, but more so than our foolish pride, we are now in a context of sovereignty, accepting responsibility of raising our own children, building our own house, growing our own food, making our own money in an independent way. And so you already had that philosophy as entrepreneurs. But we've had to learn or relearn uh, teamwork in a way that makes our ego feel like our egos are going right. against ourselves. Right. Well, it's like, well, no, I want to be working more and doing this. Yeah, but there's not space for that. Uh, and so we have to, and it's a process and it's not just talk about it and it's over. It's ongoing. It's well, that's, live. That's the adjusting the expectation, evolving into a different role, um, exercising patience, understanding what's most important, dissolving your ego. All of those are steps along the way to a true sovereignty, personal freedom. You know, if you can sacrifice those petty things then you can achieve a level of livity that's not as unfettered from a lot of people who aren't able to let go of that bullshit. You know, I think the fortunate thing for a lot of young people today is that there aren't a lot of opportunities in work, in a working career sense in the way that our parents or grandparents had them. So one has to be a bit more of a self-starter and oftentimes the tool is the internet. And I was speaking to some young guy at Home Depot the other day who looked like they were lost in the lumber aisle. So I spoke to them and they were 22 and 24, had just gotten land and were very curious about how to start going about planning or building some kind of structure. And they're asking me questions about what's the right type of lumber to use, oh, et awesome. cetera. Awesome. And the kid said that he felt the internet should be used as a tool of empowering the individual. And I said, I totally agree. Isn't that, is that not the true intention and why it was created in the first place? Scientists to share information and cross yeah. vast distances all in the, you know, they're, they're, they're working for the greater good in essence. Then if you, if you were to agree that science is you know, beneficial to humans or whatever, um, now it's been turned to this money maker for corporations in ways they can deviously, you know, rob you of your energy. The internet. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. I've been going through a bit of a, this is a bit of a tangent, but it does loop back around to sovereignty because I think it's like, I really admire you and you and your partner's lifestyle before moving here because it is a feat to get an art career going. It is a feat that's very difficult in this world. And in the same vein, it is a feat to to start up a business that does well, whether that's online or offline or both. And so lately, it's been really important to me to get my online thing going because for a long, long time, I've messed around in that realm, but I never cared about it being like a business or a career. I just liked to play with it. And these days, uh, I look at YouTube and how to be a successful YouTuber or whatever it is, and you it all boils down to providing value to others. 
everyone wants to enhance their lives. Everyone wants to learn. Everyone wants to make more money, whatever it is. If you want to make uh, income online, you provide value to people. It's as simple as that. Provide, And it's not like buy my course or buy my book. No, you give it. And then these platforms, which are these big evil tech conglomerates, don't get me wrong, they somehow enable that like creator economy for some some jerk like me to be like, you know what, I'm going to start providing value today, and I'm my goal is to turn it into a, my job, turn it into a, to a revenue stream, and so then I go and I feed content to this the big tube machine. I just feed it content, and then if I play by its rules, it'll eventually start paying me money, and that's really empowering despite it being the big evil tech companies ah man it's providing value in exchange for something else valuable is the basic concept of human barter and exchange and trade uh so there's nothing wrong with that now a lot of people who might be interested in homesteading might be like in my situation, part of that reaction was one against technology and society and, and e- economical institutions, which all of those big tech companies have become now. Uh, but as I stepped away from all of that technology and computer, the internet stuff to the land, it dissolved some sort of ego. Now I'm stepping back to it for example, in in agreeing to participate in this podcast, because I recognize that Mm -hmm. the internet is, does truly have that capability. And it doesn't matter who is making money on it. If you're spreading some sort of truth and sharing something that's valuable. And in this case, you know, my selfish reasoning is that it's going to be promoting these sort of lifestyles to people who don't have a source for the information on how to get started, then I totally agree and I want to participate because essentially I would be dismantling the system from the inside out (laughs) by helping people become truly more sovereign and free. Until they shut you off because they don't like that. But if by that time I've already, you know, hipped a couple of people to some game, then more power to them because I would just as assume you know, give someone five minutes of my time talking to them in the lumber aisle at home Depot or somebody down at the beach as I could, you know, I was talking for an hour with you essentially, and then sharing that conversation with others who'd like to hear it. And potentially reach a larger audience with less energy expended. Sure. And one thing I learned because I used Instagram and another social media platform in becoming an independently successful artist in New York City is that uh, the, the, Almost the content becomes better the less one thinks about how others would receive or expect it. And like, like art is best when it's this truer expression. And in order to how to, to find that within yourself, it takes a lot of searching and trying different things. But if you are already good at that and you can, it doesn't matter you know, people are going to hip to that and it doesn't matter how big or little it gets or how far it goes or not. You know, if there's some truth that's being spread, then that's, that's righteous, man. That's worth it. You know? So I think we're at a good place to stop for now. And I think the rest we could do in a different episode because (laughs) I feel like this has been a very good introduction to what, what are the things we need to think about? What are the, how do we, how do we start just within ourselves before we actually get going and then everyone's going to have a different situation with getting going and what that means to find the land to get it to get it started their budget their locale the team that they're so to speak going in with and i mean just so everyone knows on our list we had a few more things which is source your water uh start with the plants and then start with the animals but if there's interest i think those are three topics that could be expanded expanded upon when, so when it's much. not two hours into the conversation. Yeah, but you know, most importantly about the whole lifestyle is deciding to do it, finding the place to do it, uh, researching, re- researching in and around that, creating some sort of a vision, some sort of a dream, a goal, you know, a practical plan on 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 arriving at that point, arriving at that literal physical point, understanding that now it's going to get physical and you're going to have to start digging dirt and moving rocks and driving trucks. And then comes 
yeah finding shelter and water and starting to create your starting own, to create it your own uh vision the, the reality of that vision with plants and animals and so yeah. forth yeah that's a whole nother and from here ways. and from here it really does there's a lot of branches to this tree because sourcing your water is very different depending on where you are uh the plants you're going to plant the way you plant them the way you design your your garden is going to be different and once again animals so it would be cool to go into those maybe a little deeper with uh i guess more of an idea of who's listening <laughs> i would say just we should also just go with what we know which is hawaii centric and i'm almost like it doesn't i don't care if someone in barcelona is listening because i'd rather that it be someone in pahoa and that we could have a true feedback or discussion totally. or some interaction in real life and i agree other people bringing up points or contributing and there's a, a learning and exchange happening i i don't profess to know anything i only know what i've done what or seen learned. that's only yeah. been a few years so well that's all we can do is gather perspective and that's how we learn i mean i've learned so much from the few interactions you and i have had over the last year you know then you know the last maybe equally to what i've learned on my own i feel like sometimes it's maybe that's an exaggeration but no, i learned so much from meeting people yeah there's so many people who can just by looking at something in a different way and pointing out something you may not have seen or thought about before it can totally help change your mind and you know offer a solution totally many problems that's the beauty that we have through this sort of language uh that humans share you know the, the talking story man what a blessing mm -hmm. thank you for having me here today jordan dude christopher thank you <laughs> the pleasure yeah Sovereign States of Mind.